We're continuing our celebration of fathers or parents to being on the air for a full year now. And today we're going to be turning the tables, doing something a little bit different. We're going to be interviewing the regular host of this show, Ann Mitchell, to find out how she got involved with all this. So that's what we'll be talking about on this edition of Fathers or Parents Too. Welcome to Fathers or Parents too. And as I mentioned, we're going to be doing something a little bit different on this show. We're going to be interviewing the regular host of this program, Ann Mitchell, to find out how she got involved with all of this. So Ann, first of all, congratulations on the first full year Thank of you. Fathers or Parents too. And I know you get this question all the time. <laughs> how did you get involved with advocacy for fathers? Well, uh, Sandy, originally I got involved in it when I was in New York in undergraduate uh, university, and I had just gone through my own divorce, and I became aware of some pending legislation in New York. It was right at the time, unbeknownst to me at the time, but it turned out to be during the time when the federal government had uh, mandated that the states all had to put a child support formula in place if they wanted to uh, continue to receive AFDC funding. So the state of New York was looking at various formulas and trying to figure out which formula to put into place, and it came to my attention that some of the uh, portions of the one that they were looking at probably passing just were very, very uh, heinous, I felt, in terms of how they would be applied to non-custodial parents. Uh, basically, the way that this was brought home to me was an attorney who was a patient at a dental office I was running uh, came in very late from, for an appointment one day, and she apologized. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. I just came from Albany. I was involved in this uh, giving testimony about this child support bill. And I said, oh, well, you were in favor of it, weren't you? And she said, oh, no, actually, the family law bar is against it, and here's why. And one of the problems with the bill was that it was going to take all discretion out of the judge's hands so that no matter what the situation was, he would have to apply the formula and could not vary from it no matter what without going through some really serious hoops in terms of justifying it and writing it out. And the other one was that it would have been able to have been applied retroactively. So what that meant was that I could have gone to my ex-husband and said, given the formula they were looking at, you have to start giving me 17% of your gross and it's effective retroactive to when we first had a child support order which meant that he would have been thinking here he was current on his support he had remarried he had two small children and another one on the way and he had recently lost his job and just become reemployed and i thought you know if this law passes and i apply it to my ex-husband it would destroy him and as i said we had just come out of the divorce and finalized it and gone our you know with our own lives and so there was still a bit of that hostility there and for a second it was kind of tempting and then i thought my god you know, here we are already beyond all that, and, and the thought occurred to me that that might be a neat thing to do, and then immediately I thought, this is a terrible thing, but what about those people who are in the middle of that battle? You know, to give that kind of power and control of another person's life and to get the kids caught in the middle to someone in the heat of battle was just horrendous to me, and I was mm -hmm. stunned that uh, the legislature would even consider it. So that's kind of what got me involved. So now you're the founder and director of an organization called the Father's Rights and Equality Exchange. So having gone through your own divorce and in hearing about this inequity in the system, that's quite a jump to personally being um, involved with this to starting an organization. So how, how did that happen? Well, what happened back in New York was during that sort of epiphany I had of, of you know, it, it was really amazing, and I can't give myself any credit that I was able to see that, uh, you know, the bigger picture, and I really don't know why that happened. I'm glad it did. Um, so my very next question to this attorney was, my gosh, you know, I haven't heard about this. Why not? We've got to do something. How can this happen? And no one knows when it's really going to hurt everybody, especially the kids. And can we get a referendum? Because our, I was very politically naive at the time, and I just assumed that every citizen of every state had the ability to affect laws if they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I had a very rude awakening, and I was told, well, we don't have a referendum in New York, but you can go and testify at the public hearings about this bill. 
And I thought, well, I can't do something just on my own. We better get a bunch of people together. And so I, I basically formed a small, what I would call, Band-Aid organization back in New York just for that issue. The thing about the whole area of family law and parental equality is you can't look at one issue and you know, pick it up and look at a little bit of the carpet, you've got to pull the whole thing up with it because everything is interconnected. So that the issue of the, the proper amount of child support is related to the issue of timeshare, which is related to who gets custody, which is related to who frustrates visit. To, I mean, it's all related. Mm -hmm. So it was more a matter of the more, you know, it's like the magician scarves. They pull out a little and you just keep pulling and pulling and it never ends. And once you get involved in something like that, it's sort of hard to, to become de-involved. When I actually came out to California, which is where I live now, uh, I moved out to California for law school and I thought, okay, you know, I've done my bit and I'm exhausted and I'm going to move on with my life and make a new life for myself. And um, But within a year I was right back in and I couldn't get away from it just because it was in my blood. So how did it all start? Um, the first free meeting, you got some people <laughs> together. <laughs> Well, actually, what happened was I, I moved into the dorms at Stanford, which is where I went to law school, and I set up my computer as a bulletin board for people to dial into, and it was a way for people from the East Coast, my friends, to stay in touch with me. Mm -hmm. And, then, well, of course, what was I going to put on this bulletin board? Well, okay, a lot of these people were fathers' rights people, so I started collecting files, and I thought, I'm just going to do that. It's a hobby. Uh, but before I knew it, I got really actively involved in the Internet, and I started communicating with all these people, and I said, there's such a need. Okay, well, we'll just sort of get a few people together, and, and that's really how Free was born. And so as uh, Brent Wellman, who is one of our directors and our uh, legislative liaison, often likes to tell people who are getting meetings going in their area, the entire organization started with meetings in my living room in student housing at Stanford. And the first couple of meetings, I think there was Brent and me, and that was it, and a speaker. Um, but you know, we just kept at it, and it's just amazing how it's grown. So how big is the organization now? We now have about 1,200 members and associates uh, nationwide, a and actually some of them are in other countries. We have a pretty good constituency in Canada. Uh, we have some people in Germany and Japan. We have um, a coordinator in London. But most of the people in the United States spread out across the country, and again, that's about 11 to 1,200 people. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about FREE. What, what is it that makes up the organization? What are some of the mission statements that might be involved with the organization? FREE is about what we practice is a three-prong approach to addressing the problems that non-custodial parents and their children encounter. We are a father's rights organization and you know so that is who we work with primarily is single fathers and and their children but primarily the fathers. And the three-prong approach we take is we provide support we provide education and we provide legislative action. So in a support le uh, area, what we do is we provide uh, direct support to people who call. We have a hotline and we have volunteers who call the people back and talk to them, provide support and direct them to resources, tell them about their local free meetings. And that's another area that we provide support is the free meetings where we have all the people in the same area get together once a month. They often will have a guest speaker, someone in the legislature or an attorney or just someone related uh, to the field. And uh, that's another way we provide support. And then we have some fun functions. We have a, a Father's Day picnic in the park in the regions where we have a lot of people. We uh, you know, do those sorts of things. And of course, we have this television show. And we provide outreach and support through the show to you know, all sorts of places across the country. Uh, the next prong is education. Uh, through the support, of course, we educate our members. But we also strive to educate both the public <coughs> and the media, along with the public, and then also the legislatures, so that we, um, we do public service announcements. We are very active in notifying the media of uh, important events and information. For example, uh, Free just affiliate, not affiliated, but worked out an arrangement with the very first agency to offer child support insurance to non-custodial parents. And as soon as we did that, we notified the media because we felt it was a momentous occasion and we wanted the media to be educated as to these issues. And of course, if the media writes a story, then we've educated you know, everyone who reads or watches that particular media outlet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then likewise with the legislature, we try to educate them as to the issues and concerns that non-custodial parents have. And that leads into the third prong, which is our legislative action. We actually have people that go to their, uh, their state capitals and talk to the legislators, and, and it's, it's 
kind of like lobbying, but it's much more just about education. A lot of times these uh, people in the legislatures haven't really heard that side of the story. What they've heard is very active, loud, angry women's groups saying all men are deadbeats and they mm -hmm. don't care about their kids and they just want to control people. And uh, they don't realize that there's a lot of really good, caring, responsible fathers out there who are being kept from their kids. So how do you see free differing from some of the other fathers' organizations? I know there are a number of other ones out there. Is there one message that sort of differentiates free from the others? Do we, does free work with some of these other organizations? Uh, I think there's a couple of things which really make us different. One is, uh, and primarily, the people we have involved uh, who are just absolutely phenomenal. Yourself, for example, and uh, the volunteers who are working on this TV show, and the people who return the phone calls, and who run the meetings, and who go to the state capitals. The really amazing thing is that they stay around and stay involved, and that makes us unique from any other father's organization I know, local or national. We have guys who went through their divorces and their situations years ago, and they are still involved with Free, and they've still stuck around and pulled together and, and formed a cohesive unit, which is extremely unusual in the men's field. Mm -hmm. In terms of messages, what makes us a bit different is that we are very much not what I call an angry men's group. We're not a bunch of militant guys who are uh, striking out because they're hurt and therefore angry, which isn't to say our guys aren't hurt and angry, but rather than using that uh, sort of negative energy, they've turned it into something positive, to have a positive impact and to change the system. System. Rather than railing against the system, our philosophy is to work within the system to change it. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the members of FREE. So I'm gathering that becoming a member of FREE, um, there are some benefits to, to being a member of the organization. Now you mentioned the um, child support insurance, which mm -hmm. is a new benefit. Can you talk a little bit about um, other benefits? Absolutely. We actually have two levels of association with FREE. It costs absolutely nothing to be affiliated, particularly if you have access to the Internet. We maintain massive email lists, which are broken down by state and region and interest, so that all of our members members across the nation who have access to the internet can be notified instantly of things that are going on in their area or say letter writing campaigns or or you know new issues of the day uh, and that costs nothing. It costs nothing to attend our meetings. There's no dues to, to show up at a meeting and uh, obtain that benefit. There's absolutely no fee to use any of our resources. We have um, a worldwide website that has all sorts of amazing information. Our webmaster's done just an amazing job with that. Uh, however, if, the, if someone does want to actually join and become a full member and support us in that way, um, membership is $95 a year, but what they get for that includes a free consultation with a an attorney in their state, uh, which in itself is worth way more than $95 in most instances. Um, they get a subscription to Modern Dad magazine. They get a copy of an absolutely wonderful book called Putting Kids First, which is all about how to, how to work things out, if possible, with your co parent and put your child first and, and get along and get out of this sort of cycle of, of court actions and fighting that people end up in. And then another wonderful book which is called Custody for Fathers which is written by an attorney that has very practical advice about if you are going to end up in court, you know, the best way to, to help yourself and help your case. Um, they also get our newsletter. And of course, they get access to all of our other resources. And as you said, um, a new benefit is this child support insurance. It's just been offered as of last month by one agency in the country. And we have worked very closely with them. And as a result, uh, they have offered to our members a discounted sign-up fee. Um, so that's a very nice benefit. And then we have one other really neat benefit, which is called our free roof program. And full members actually open their homes up to other members who need to travel outside of their home areas to visit with their children. So uh, that's a neat benefit. That's wonderful. Well, I know that we're going to have some questions from our audience in just a few minutes. Okay. So uh, we'll be right back after this. I'm a dad and a member of FREE, the Father's Rights and Equality Exchange. Most dads out there would love to spend more time with their kids, to be a real part of their lives. Free wants to change the notion that all divorced dads are irresponsible because most of us are dads who are responsible and we're working for a chance to share the parenting. If you want to learn more, please call us at 1-500-4-DADS. That's 1-500-4-DADS. And remember, fathers are parents too. 
Welcome back to Fathers or Parents 2. Today we're interviewing Ann Mitchell, who is the regular host of this program. And I believe we have a question from the audience. Yes, go ahead. Well, you've talked a lot about what free does and how it helps people, but it runs a lot on volunteers. And around here it's probably easier to get volunteers because you're based here. But uh, what are your suggestions or ideas for someone in, say, another random state uh, who doesn't want to save the world and doesn't want to make it a full-time job but is willing to help out a bit, you know, what opportunities would they have in uh, other states to help out in the, in the cause? That, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, people anywhere, whether it's in a state or another country, can get as involved as they want with as much time or as little time as they want, and there are opportunities at every level. Uh, from having being a meeting coordinator, which involves just basically organizing a meeting once a month, which only takes a couple of hours a month, uh, to being a call volunteer or to actually coordinating other call volunteers, to helping organize letter writing campaigns. If they live near their state capital, they can organize a trip to the state capital to call on their uh, assemblymen and senators. So there's all sorts of things people can do, all the way up to being a state coordinator which does involve a bit more time, but even there, uh, it's a function of how much time they have to give. Okay, I believe we have another question. Uh, yes, uh, congratulations on the uh, first year anniversary of your organization. Thank you. What would you like to see accomplished in the future? How would you like to see all this resolved when you don't need free anymore? You just answered your own question. Nothing would make me happier than for free to become obsolete. Um, I would like to also clarify and thank you for the congratulations. This is our one year anniversary of the show. Actually, Free as an Organization has been around for about five years. Um, this is our first year having a nonprofit organization, but the sister organization, which is the not for profit one, which does more of our lobbying sorts of things, has been around since about uh, 1990. But uh, to answer your primary question, that's what I would like to see for the future. Um, and that's actually something that highlights and illustrates why uh, some of the other organizations, not so much men's organizations, but some of the women's organizations, uh, seem to now be coming out of left field with some of their positions. For instance, some of the more mainstream organizations now are taking some very radical advocacy views. And one theory about that is, as women have started achieving equality, for example, women now in the workplace who are ages 27 to 32, uh, at least ones that don't have children, are now at near parity wage-wise with their male counterparts. Those women are earning 98 cents to every dollar that the men are earning. So as women are achieving parity and equality, some of these organizations that have done such a good job are facing actually being obsolete. And in order to maintain their funding and their political base, they have to be self-perpetuating. That's not what we plan for free, and I would be absolutely thrilled to have free dissolve because we have equality for both parents. Thank you. So one of the things that you were mentioning is some of the legislative activity that free is involved with and some of the media activity that free is involved with. Mm -hmm. and, and also, as you mentioned, we keep hearing a great deal in the media about um, single mothers and issues of single mothers. Do you see free having an effect on some of these, these issues from um, the non-custodial father's point of view? We, we do, and it's really encouraging when I can actually point to various pieces of legislation, for example, that have helped balance the playing field that Free has been actively involved in. Uh, and one of the most heartening things is in those state capitals where we are most active, such as in Sacramento and California, we've actually become recognized as a credible authoritative source by the legislators themselves. So for example, we worked very closely with one of the sponsoring legislators of a bill that was called the Mrs. Doubtfire Bill in California, which unfortunately did not pass and will be reintroduced uh, at the next opportunity. But that bill was one which would have allowed non-custodial parents to be the child care provider, quote unquote, of choice if the custodial parent needed child care, which makes perfect sense. You know, have the child be with their other parent instead of a babysitter. Uh, you would not believe the firestorm of opposition that bill met and the author contacted us and said we would like you to be involved in reauthoring the bill to meet the opposition so that we can address their credible concerns but not have the baby thrown out with the bathwater. And we were so honored uh, because that really demonstrated that they had a measure of trust in us and in our methods and in our 
our belief system. Uh, we also often now are called by various state legislators and also the legislatures from other states looking for, uh, for statistics because they know that we never will put forth a statistic that is not backed by credible evidence. Uh, for instance, the federal census, we often use the figures that come out of there. People are blown away when I tell them that 75% uh, of all support ordered in our country is paid. And that comes from our federal census. And they're astonished because most organizations out there are not using credible, citable studies when they're giving out their information. They're just giving the information that sounds very good and it's anecdotal and it's got great right. uh, wow value, I call it. So uh, that we've, we've had a real difference in that regard. So people calling into the free hotline, I'm sure that many of them are in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very emotional time for a lot of people. What is the, the typical reason that somebody comes to join free? You mean as a full member? As a or full as member a... or just to call that hotline? Well, people will call our hotline uh, from a couple of different perspectives. Sometimes they call simply because they have already been somewhat through the system and they have heard about us a bit after the fact, but they still are dealing with some of the residual issues. So for example, when we're on Ricky Lake, our hotline is absolutely flooded, but it's not always people in crisis. It's often people saying, oh my God, I wish I had known about you two years ago, but here's my situation now. And even though it's calmed down some, it's still far from ideal and what can I do to make it even a better situation? And then there are the people who really are, as you mentioned, in crisis, and they come to us either through a media appearance or just because they're looking. Uh, the ACLU refers to us. We're listed with various libraries and in all sorts of uh, organizational encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. So they come to us from all different avenues, and I think to some extent, the level of crisis they're in uh, is, is indicative of the avenue they've come to us through. Someone who's researching at the library is not the person who's in high crisis. Uh, those are the people that come to us through, say, the ACLU or the local court system uh, who may refer us to us um, or even their attorneys. And when they come to us in that regard, what they're looking for usually uh, is something to make them feel better right then and there. And I don't mean a panacea, but some assurance. Often these are people who have suddenly come home and found everyone gone. And they don't know where their children are, or they do know where they are, and where they are is three states away, and they are panicked. And they feel like their, their whole world has just slipped out from under them, and they want someone to tell them it's going to be okay. It's not going to be great but it's not going to be as awful as it feels right now and there are things you can do to help your situation so that's pretty much what they're looking for and then of course they want uh, you know some practical advice as well right, right. I believe we have another question from the audience yes uh, yes uh, following up my previous question what do you see as the single greatest hurdle to achieving equality in this situation to uh, playing on a level field Wow, the single biggest hurdle. Well, let me tell you about the thing that I most often rail against. Um, and this is the thing that most often gets me in trouble uh, as well. I think one of the biggest problems in our society today has been where the women's movement has gone. And what I mean by that is in the family law arena, it is no longer about equality, if it ever was, with regards to men versus women, mothers versus fathers. I feel that the women's movement at this point in our history has done more to uh, set off the balance in family law and to m make the, the playing field, which is already uneven, even more uneven, because it's an area of law where women are incredibly empowered in a way that they have never in their lives been empowered before. And rather than see some sort of a, a having the pendulum swing back to a sort of an equitable middle stance, what the women's movement now is doing as, as there's starting to be equality in the family arena, you know, fathers are starting to get more timeshare and it, women are now being presumed that maybe they'll go out and earn a living after divorce instead of staying home because even married couples have to have two incomes in many areas. What happens is now we have the women's movement, the sort of more radical fringe feminists, the authors and, and the spokespeople are saying things like, well, didn't you know that only women can nurture? Uh, men aren't nurturing. They can't, uh, they don't have any kind of a parental instinct. So, so women have to be the primary caretakers because only women have that special bond. And that's a double-edged sword because what it's doing on one hand is it's perpetuating this real uh, division and divisiveness between men and women because women are being told, you know, you have to have the kids and, and the guy's got to pay for it uh, and support you. 
but that also not only is cutting the men out, but it's forcing women, relegating them back into the nursery. And uh, I argue, and I truly believe, that that message is telling women you know, who you are first and foremost is a child care provider. And so you don't even have options because if you opt to not follow this maternal bond that we know only women can have this nurturing relationship with their kids, then you are actually turning your back on your sort of ordained, uh, predestined obligation. So I, I see that, the sort of um, co-opting of women back into the nursery and at the same time the excising of men out of families to be really the single, single biggest obstacle because it's so pervasive throughout all of society, not just in the family law arena, uh, but also, you know, the message is there in our schools, it's there in the media. You know, choosy mothers choose GIF, choosy fathers apparently, uh, you know, go to McDonald's. So I, I, I think societal perceptions about the roles is really the biggest obstacle. So speaking about women, um, and, and a little bit briefly because we are running out of time, okay. I know that there are a number of women that are involved with FREE, yes. and a lot of FREE members are remarried or they have someone new in their lives. Right. Um, how are these women involved with the organization, and is there is there a place for them in this organization? Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the ways that they're involved, many women are involved in uh, working with and providing support for other second spouses because it's a very difficult situation to be in. Uh, just as often uh, fathers and mothers who are divorced expect that it's going to be over now and they don't have to deal with each other. Well, of course they do because they have you know, children they share and they have to co-parent those children. When a new spouse comes into the picture, they don't expect that they're inheriting an ex-wife. And this is a very big issue, and it can often lead to the breakup of the second relationship just because the stress and strain and having no outlet uh, to, to sort of let some of that steam off is very difficult, or even just to understand why some of this area is out of your control. So one of the things that they do is provide support to each other. Uh, but another very big and important area that the second spouses and the mothers and the other women involved uh, provide support for is our legislative work. Because I can tell you, speaking as a woman and a single mother, when I go and talk to a legislator, they listen a lot more readily than they do to the father because they assume the father is there with an ax to grind. Whereas when I get up there and I say, I'm a single mother and I'm here on behalf of single fathers, there's such a dichotomy and contrast there that, that they sit up and listen. Okay. Well, thank you. We've run out of time. Already? But thank oh. you for allowing us to interview you this time. It was my pleasure. And thank you for joining us on Fathers or Parents Too.